I'll be speaking about runtime run metaprogramming. Most of what I've been showing you, you probably don't want to do, but sometimes you have no choice. My name is Mayor Moore. I'm from Spark Beyond, a machine learning artificial intelligence startup. We try to make, make tools to help data scientists and others solve really tough problems and incorporating lots of world knowledge into problem solving. I'm going to talk a lot about Scala Reflection. I'm going to show the compiler toolbox. I'm going to try to show an example of why you might actually need to do some of these things. As I said, you probably don't. First of all, just so I have an idea of the audience, uh, whoever here used the Java Reflection or any sort of Reflection? Excellent. Who's done Scala Reflection? Who's done code generation? Okay, so we've got good crowd. And we'll start. I'm gonna use some guiding examples so we'll explain a few aspects of what the company does. So one of the things we try to do is we try to find how you can, tr can transform your data in order to uh, to solve a, a machine learning, a predictive problem. So we, we put codes together in various ways. But we also allow the user to craft a, a, a data transformation pipeline uh, to explicitly do stuff with this data, which will obviously be typed, etc. And we want the pipeline to be deeply embedded. So we not only do operations, we know what we're doing. So we can do it lazily, and we can replay it, and we can uh, manipulate the, the transformations itself, the operations we're doing, and replace the data, or such like, which you can do only if, if you have a, a deeply embedded operations. So if we have our guiding example, we will want to define operations on a data. We can add a column, we can uh, filter it, we can uh, join them, we can do aggregations. We have various operations which we can do. And we will, these all have parameters, and we will obviously model these, the parameters and the operations in, in case classes. Each is different, they all have some same trait. And we can stack them together. Now, one of the aspects of this is that we want these to be very extensible operations. For example, how would you define uh, an add column? You have, you have your data, you want to add a column, so we need some sort of uh, language to allow the user to extend stuff and write code snippets, to write an expression based on some attributes of a row to create something new. So uh, naturally, since we're here at Scalapino, the language we'll be using to allow the user to extend our system in is Scala, not Node. Um, and we want to be able to know and have a UI for all of this stuff. So we will want to create a, a UI to expose our case classes, how you input them, what parameters they have, etc. I won't be discussing any of the UI aspects, but just how do you discover what you have and how you can do with this. So here's a bit of examples of what we're going to do. I'm pleasantly surprised by we can actually read the code. We'll be seeing a lot of code. So we have uh, a few actions. We have the add column, which has its name and the expression. And we have a slightly more interesting example. We have another action which does something complicated. And it also has an interesting parameter, not necessarily 
a simple string parameter. And since I have no good way of entering this fancy parameter, special parameter, which has a function inside it, I have no, I don't want to mess with entering this in the UI, so I decided for the UI purposes, I will just allow only a few specific values, and I will want the UI to render a drop down or some other selection widget. And I would like to be able to expose this information. So I would like this to work. I would like to be able to just add arbitrary annotations on my uh, parameter, which contain arbitrary types, including lambdas, as I have in the example, and we would like to make this work. So before that, I'm going to do just a really basic of basics in order to work with Scala uh, reflection. We always work through a mirror, and there are various philosophical reasons for the idea of mirrors, which I won't be discussing. But we know we need to have a mirror, and the mirror captures the class loader, which we're working with. And if you have environments with multiple class loaders, this becomes an issue you need to be constantly aware of. If you're running in play, if you're running through, through SBT, if you're, uh, you have multiple class loaders you need to be aware of, and you can't see, so some class loaders can't see other stuff. So that's not something I'm going to discuss, just something you need to be aware of and know you're creating your, uh, your mirror with the correct class loader. The simplest way of getting the class loader is just this or some other class, get class, get its class loader. You can take the context class loader or others. And we need to work through the mirror for the reflection operations. And you can, another, this quick introduction, we have various players which we need to discuss. We have the type, symbol, tree, our stuff we're going to be dealing with. These are all in the Scala documentation, which I deeply recommend reading. A type is vaguely related to the idea you are as presumably familiar with of a class. So it more or less represents the same thing as Classes are, are obviously a type. Primitives are also types. But a type can be something else. For example, list of int. It includes the type parameters. It can include existential types. Types can be with, uh, with type parameters still partially missing or have bounds. So a type represents anything. This is the object we use. And one of the beauties in the Scala reflection framework is we're essentially using the same stuff the compiler itself uses. So the Scala reflection and the Scala compiler are, are, are very, very well linked. You're dealing with the same things. Uh, a key annoyance with working with types is that equality does not do what you expect it to do. Whenever you're comparing types, you should never ever use, well, Probably never. I've never needed to use equality operations. You always use the special equals, colon equals operation to compare types. And this will deal with type aliases correctly and other issues. And you can do assignability with uh, less or weak. The difference between these two uh, operators is weak will be aware of operations between, for example, an int and a long that you can assign a, an integer to a long variable, and this will be promoted with the views, which is not quite the implicits. And neither of these operations will handle implicit conversions. So if you have implicit, if something is assignable to something else, to a parameter or such like, via implicit conversions, you'll need to deal with that uh, the hard way. But just to an idea, the idea of regular subclasses, um, of sub-trait implements a trait, you can check between types. And there are a bunch of useful uh, methods, which will be seen most of those in uh, the rest of the examples. 
A symbol is something else. So the general rule is, in many cases, you can think of a symbol as vaguely related to, to a token from, from, from the lexer, if you think of compilers, but actually a symbol is more than that. A symbol is anything which has a name. In particular, uh, types, you have a type symbol, or classes, variables, methods, method parameters, uh, and uh, probably a bunch of all other things. And we can get them from a type, and a lot of the operations we actually do through the symbol, and we'll see this later on. And the last thing is trees. You usually bump into these when you're dealing with macros, but I will not be talking about macros because as I started off, I'm talking about the runtime metaprogramming, not uh, the um, compile time metaprogramming done by macros. But a tree represents uh, the abstract syntax tree, and there are some simple examples. I copy pasted this from the Scala documentation of what it looks like, the various elements which all make up a tree. And I've also used an example of the reify macro, which is another way of creating trees. And then there's the last one I didn't show, which is quasi quotes. But since I'm not actually discussing tree manipulation, we can leave that. And we'll be using this later on to access uh, abstract syntax trees in runtime. So the first is a very simple reflection operation. We want to have a class. We discussed our, well, we're talking about our, uh, we have our operations, for example, the add column. And we want to know what parameters it has, what, what does a constructor get, etc. If we're all in the world of case classes, so uh, life is simple, where the constructor parameters and the data members and the getters, they're all the same. Uh, in other cases, you need to deal with them independently, but it will be in a similar fashion. So we can take a type and we use the type of macro. The type of is a, is a macro which will get the type and replace it with the type object. So it returns the type. So we get add column, for example. And in a, in a real scenario, you probably wouldn't be starting with the type this way. Because if you have the type, you know what you're doing, and you don't need to be dealing with runtime metaprogramming in the first place. But I'm just showing the simplest way to get a type, and let's continue as if we did not actually know we had the add column. We lost this because we have many of these, and we need to reflect all of them, for example. Or we want to reflect a whole bunch of them in a row. So we can find. From the type, we can find many things. For example, we can find the primary constructor, which is a symbol, it's a method symbol. And we can find the parameters. The parameters of the method are in themselves, also represented by a symbol. And we can see what they look like. So we will get a list of parameters. We have column name and code expression as before. And they have their own type information on them and lots of other stuff which we will look at in a moment. Now, notice, uh, I, for simplicity, I just flattened uh, the list. In Scala, a method, and in particular a constructor, can have multiple parameter lists, including implicits, if you've been looking at the yucky example outside in the booth. <laughs> Uh, and we can see what we have. Uh, if I'm unclear or anything you want to understand better as opposed to more general questions, just stop me anytime. I'll answer them at will. So 
Uh, actually, I should go back. Before we continue, we, will say, we can use this in order to figure out the first part of our problem. <coughs> what uh, parameters do our various operations have? And we can get this and package it and send it out to uh, whatever we have in the UI level to generate examples. I'm just showing that this is actually can be useful. So we can use this information to render which fields we have and what their types are, etc. The other problem we wanted to talk about is how we use code fragments. How we use uh, code uh, from our, my guiding example was we want to allow the user to put in code snippets and we want to run them. So the user would say, I want to divide column A by column B and I would be able to do this later on. So we obviously need some way of, of compiling what you did, or doing some sort of code generation in order to be able to actually run what you wrote. So there are uh, a few ways of doing this. Some of you might be familiar with uh, CGLib or ASM or other uh, libraries for manipulating Java bytecode. I won't be talking about those at all. Uh, uh, there's plenty of material. You could just compile externally, run Scala C, create a class file, create a jar, um, and, and then load it. And I'm going to show uh, that. Then there's another way of loading a jar, which I will show. And finally, the compiler toolbox, which is the method I will be most interested in showing you. It's dead simple. So if I want to load classes in Scala, I do this with a class loader. Uh, the most common class loader is a URL class loader. So all I have to do, if I have, I generate a jar, I want to load something new, I will create a URL class loader, I will give it one or more uh, jars or uh, directories with classes which I want to load and I will have a new class loader. Now, what do I do with a class loader? Well, I can load classes. So, we can get from a class loader, we can get a new mirror. We decide a mirror is based on a class loader and we can instantiate it. Now, this you can do something very similarly also in Java reflection, nothing terribly special with the Scala way in doing this. You use a mirror instead, so the methods are different. But essentially, we took a jar, we created a class loader, we find the constructor, we run the constructor, assuming we have a no R constructor for what we want, we get the class. Similarly, we could do other operations, uh, find a find a static, uh, an object with no constructor, reflect the, get the module, uh, or we could continue doing operations with the class, with the instance, or inspect it in various ways once we have the, the objects in hand. Now, one of the main problems with doing it this way is you, when you add a new URL class loader, is that if you have a reference from somewhere to some other class loader, or somewhere else, possibly in one of your serialization libraries, they use the different uh, class loader, it's unaware of this new class. And if it will try to reflect it, it will fail horribly because it's not using the right class loader, you just create a new one. So then, I will show the, pos the following horrible hack. And because it's so horrible, I wrote it in Java. <laughs> <laughs> you could do just the same in Scala. This has nothing to do. All of this is basic reflection. It works the same. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm looking for the system class loader. There's always a system class loader. Uh, main class loader, 
and I, assuming it's a URL class loader, it doesn't have to be, but I've never bumped into a system where it wasn't. Uh, I'm sure there are such. So I'm just changing it. Now, obviously, and this is a key reflection trick, which is one of the reasons I'm showing this, uh, they don't actually expose. It's not designed to be mutated. So the URL class loader has an add URL method, but it's uh, protected or private, I call, whatever. You can't access it. I can't just call the add URL method on it. So again, we have a, a reflection to the, to the rescue. So we get the class loader. Then we reflect it, standard Java reflection. We get the find the add URL method. And all we do is we do this magic thing, set accessible true. And voila, it's no longer private. <laughs> and we can call this, uh, call private methods, do anything you like. And this is uh, one more thing you can do with reflection. And probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> this will allow you to change the class loader. You don't have now multiple class loaders, which None of them are aware of each other. You have just one class loader, which has also the new stuff you wanted. And now, a more Scala-oriented approach. We have the compiler toolbox. The compiler toolbox basically allows you to use the compiler in a very small fragments from within your own Scala code. So, yet again, we need to start with a mirror, so we create a toolbox. And the toolbox has several key methods. Parse, type check, eval. Parse and eval are actually the most interesting things. So parse is a very simple method. It takes a string and produces a tree. What kind of tree? Abstract syntax tree. Same type of tree you would use if you were doing with macros. Same type of tree the Scala compiler uses internally to represent uh, code, and we can parse code, get a abstract syntax tree, and then if I want to evaluate, to run the tree and get a result, if I want to, if I have the tree which represents one plus one, and I want to evaluate it and get the integer two, I can do that by just running eval. And if I create a new class and I want to get the instance of it, I can do that too. And create almost anything I want from this. Now notice, this is the simple method I use in order to run it. I added a few stuff. I, what I recommend doing, adding these imports. Because when you just use the toolbox as is, you do not have any of the, you do not have anything in the scope. You do not have even stuff which you normally expect to have in scope. You expect to have some basic implicits just there when you work in Scala. These are in the pre-diff, which is always imported. But when you use the toolbox, <coughs> you are not. So if you want your code to behave in a reasonable way, if you want to have the, the right arrow in scope, and just in general, if you want your code to behave reasonably, you almost always want to, to import uh, Scala and Predef, just so, so you won't have to explicitly write out everything, and it will work like you expect Scala code to behave. Um, So this, again, can uh, help with our guardian example. I have a little a user fragment, a uh, code fragment. I will probably want to create a method out of it. Say I have the add column or a filter expression of saying I want I had uh, my column named height and I want to multiply it with 
uh, width. So I would have type height times width. Or maybe I want to create a geometric mean, so I will do the square root of the height and the width. And I will expect the user to type in this that fragment. And then I, what I would want to do, I would want to get a method. So I need to add some boilerplate, probably, to get a method definition around it. Maybe define the variables. I don't want the user to do it explicitly. And, to, um, and then I send it, as before, to the previous method. And I will get a method, essentially a lambda, which I could then apply on anything I want and pass it on to anything. <coughs> the other part we had in our example initially is we had annotations. Annotations are a great way of marking stuff on your code in a consistent fashion. If I want to have information about my classes, my functions, my variables, and I want to be able to know something about it, one way is to have some XML hell, or uh, nowadays JSON hell, would be the more uh, hip way on side, and I would hope somehow they are consistent. And if I want to ensure consistency, the easiest way is to have it in the code itself. The information about the code should be in the code. So, in our example previously, we had an annotation about a, a possible values or how it is supposed to aid the uh, UI generation uh, of what can you do in order to create this parameter or this class. But that's just one example of things you can annotate. In Java, as the slides most of you have probably read, Annotations are fairly simple, and they're fairly easy to use, but they can't do all that much. In particular, you can't put arbitrary types on them. So this forces you to either not use annotations or do some stuff which we don't like doing very much, like encode things in strings, which though, as we said, we can encode anything in a string, including code, Scala code, as we saw previously, this is probably not the best way of doing things. We would much prefer to work in a more uh, typed way and have things compile and put whatever type I feel like on an annotation. Now, in Scala, you can put anything you like in an annotation. Scala Annotations are not Java annotations. They're not necessarily accessible as Scala annotation, as Java annotations, so you can't necessarily read them. As I said, you can put arbitrary types. They obviously do not conform. But if you want to read them, it's not as easy as you would like. Much. Not, not trivial to get the values out of them if you want to read them in runtime. So, we start by defining an annotation, and we can put anything, I, I put even an, an any, and uh, obviously you can uh, put any type you like. And I extended static annotation, I extended static annotation because in a similar to Java annotation which have a retention policy, if we want it to be retained to be available in runtime as well, and not just assist the compiler in some strange way, then we need to have the static annotation. What will happen is that this information will actually be in the Scala signature inside the class. So it all goes to, to one big place. And then later you should be able to access this in runtime. Now, how will you access this? With Scala reflection through a mirror through the symbols as we saw earlier. So, we have uh, our uh, previous example. We had, we had something annotated, and we want to take the special action, find the parameter, and read the annotation. So, uh, we take the, the param list, uh, I 
probably misnamed this variable, but never mind. Not longest param list. It's this the the parameter list from the primary constructor or from the factory or from wherever. And we can take the first parameter and we get the first parameter. We know it's a symbol and it's a, it's a value, foo. That's what we called it. So from the parameter, we can get the annotations and we see it has a bunch of annotations. It has a list of annotations. In this case, it has just one. And we can see the annotations. But what we actually want is not to see the annotation. We want to get the value hidden from the annotation, the map. We actually want to get the map, not the annotation. And surprisingly enough, it does not actually sit anything of the values map, or we expect. We do not actually have a values map object or a map string any object in here anywhere. So what we do have is the code representing them. Now, because we put it in an annotation, it obviously was generated in compile time, so it obviously does not actually get any parameters or doesn't capture anything. So the tree which created it is really everything we need. So if we take the first annotation, we get a tree representing the values map, which is not the values map. It's of type tree. And inside it, there will be another tree, but not something of type map, or not something of type string, and not something of the lambda functions which we had previously. If we want to take the tree and convert it into something normal scala types, then what we get is we use the toolbox. We can evaluate the tree. Just evaluating the tree normally fails because the toolbox sadly doesn't like to, uh, will fail. It says you can't evaluate a typed tree. So even though we actually get from the annotations the type tree, I tell it to forget the types, figure it out later. And so we do untype check child and then we send it to the evaluate. And then we get the actual annotation object. And the actual annotation object is the values map. That's the class we defined. It behaves like it. I can cast it to the annotation type I expect. And I can inspect its members, and I will get the maps, and the strings, and the functions, and anything else I want. So if I would want to uh, reflectively read the keys and send that to the client side, that's fine. I can do that. If I want to get a key from the client side and look it up in the map, I can do that now. But only after going through the toolbox in order to uh, actually convert the annotation tree to the actual class we defined the annotation in. Now, the last thing is something uh, I'm sure people have bumped into, and there are many ways to deal with this. Uh, I'm assuming everybody has, most people here are uh, familiar with the idea of type erasure? Who here knows what type erasure is? Almost everybody. We don't actually save type parameters for runtime. Now, there are the good ways of dealing with this. The good ways are to have your class structure properly, have it traded properly, add type tags, use type evidence, etc. And then there is the way I'm going to show you which assumes you do not have type tags, for whatever reason you have lost type information by your fault or by someone else's. And we still want to know what type we have for real. Now, obviously, in some cases, you can't tell. You can't recreate the information. It's gone. But in many cases, it's actually possible by inspecting deep inside. So if I have a list which contains one, I can figure out it's the list of int. If I have an empty list, I can't figure out. It's just, a, it's just an empty list. There's no more information there to be extracted. 
But in many, many cases, there is more information to be extracted, but just regular reflection would not produce it. So we have a slightly less than trivial example, not the easiest example. We have making it slightly interesting, and we're going to show some interesting parts of the reflection library in the process. So I defined my own uh, sequence of ints, which has exactly one integer in it all the time. And I'm not actually showing the implementation. It's fairly simple. But the important thing to notice is that I extend sequence of int. And sequence obviously has a type parameter, a generic parameter, int, in this case. But my class one insect does not have any type parameters at all. And I have a case class, which has two type parameters, T and U, and two members of type T and of type sequence of U. Just to show the type parameters, we don't necessarily have something which matches the type parameter exactly. It can be some, some, in some way related to it. And I create a value V, which uses my new sequence. Now, we would like to be able to solve the problem, given V, find the type my case class string of int. Now, we should all be able to infer this, but inferring this automatically is not actually that simple. So it will take us a few slides to do this. So the first thing we do when we have a value and we want to know what type it is, so we'll, we use a mirror, we'll reflect it, and we'll be able to get easily that it's uh, my case class. But we still, still don't have any type parameter information. So just finding the erased type is easy. Then we need to find out what are we missing. What are the parameters we have? We need to know we're missing stuff. When what, what we know we're missing stuff. So let's look at the primary constructor to see what can we learn about these type parameters. And we see we know we have the primary parameters. And we know their types, t and sequence of u. And we know we can look at lm or another of the names. So and it is in many cases, we can learn from the members something about the type parameters. Assuming they are not lost, assuming the information is actually there. So we'll look what else we have. I'm just showing some basic stuff to do in reflection. We use decals, which is a new version of declarations. And we can look what we have. And we see, we see the various methods and values and the constructor. We have the getter methods we have. Lots of stuff we can see. These are all symbols, by the way. And we can extract specific ones. So we look at the, we take, we make an instance mirror. We're reflecting the value. So we get an instance mirror to reflect it. And uh, this is not a regular mirror as we had previously, the runtime mirror. It's a mirror which is bound to the specific instance so I can do operations about the specific value I'm holding. Now, we take the type, we look at the, we kick out the methods, we're looking for the values which actually hold the data. And we get the value lm. From it, we can actually, using the instance mirror, we can actually run it. This is the same thing as a method invocation which we saw doing in Java Reflection. So it's, this is the Java way of doing, um, reflecting, in this case, a, a data member. And we get the value. In this case, the value who, which is a string. So we can check what we have and we know it's a string. Now, 
this actually solved us the first problem of the first type parameter. We knew LM was defined to be of a type parameter T, and we see in reality on the value we have at hand, it is a string. So we know T is a string. That was fairly easy. Now the other type parameter, we shall recall, was the member was not identically the type parameter. We had a type parameter U, but the member was of type sequence of U. So we have an extra hurdle to bypass. So we'll do the same thing. We'll look at the member, the member other, and we, using the same technique as the previous slide, we discover it is of type 1 in sec. Now, 1 in sec, that doesn't solve our problem because we are trying to find out what the type parameter u is. So we need to n figure out how does 1 in sec relate to the formal type sequence of u. So we know the formal type. The formal type we know from the type signature of the parameter. That would be sequence of u. And then we use the base type method to see how one type relates to its base type. Now, the symbol needs to be a base type. If you give it something which is not a base type, it will fail. But in this case, it can't because of the way we found the values. And then we get that one set, one insect is sequence of int. And then we can take out the type parameter and we know what it is. This is not a full code, but I'm showing the building blocks used in order to uh, finish up everything. So obviously, this is not the first way you want to solve a type erasure. But I have, in more than one case, found this technique useful, especially when dealing with code I didn't write. Or also in cases where I have uh, types defined only at runtime, because we're doing dynamic stuff, because those user entered contact, which defines the types we use from a wide set of types. Not only a handful of types, but really the user can control the types flowing for our system in a more deep way and apply various code which we can't really control at compile time. And this allows us to overcome erasure in, uh, without, even if the code does itself does not pass along the extra type information with it, as in type tags. I forgot to, oh, the last thing. We have, we want to put everything together. So I'm showing one more method. We had the type, with the top type, we knew over which was our class, my case class, and we knew, we found the type parameters. We knew the first one is a string and the second one is an int. And we want to put them together, so we use apply type, which gets a type and a sequence of types. And we put them together, and it, glues them all together and produces a new type. And that was what we were trying to <coughs> accomplish. And that's it. Obviously we're recording. One of the reasons I'm here. <laughs> and uh, I'm open for questions. So, yeah, we have five minutes for questions. Any questions? Other than uh, writing, uh, generating code and r at runtime, is there really a reason to use runtime reflection other than macros? Uh, no, you, 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 you obviously, in some cases, runtime reflection is easier. You almost always, macros are safer because they're validated at compile time. Uh, you may not know everything in, uh, in 
in compile time, may not know what you need to do. Some things I, you should be able to do at uh, compile time, but I failed to do, and did a reflection just for that. For example, finding out all the subclasses of a CL trait. Uh, and that's something which should be possible in compile time, but I have no idea how to do that. And in some cases, you can't know that at compile time because you're, if you're not looking at a CL trait, you're looking at a bunch of classes which you don't know where they came from, from a plugin jar somebody typed in, then obviously you can't do that at compile time at all, and especially if it's user-generated code, but it doesn't have to be user-generated code, it's just code you don't have at compile time. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>